Good morning, friends. Good morning. Good morning and welcome to Second Congregational Church, where whoever you are or wherever you are on life's journey, you, you are, are welcome here. here. You are welcome here on this fifth Sunday of Lent. Um, we are engaged in our Lenten theme this year of again and again, and again and again this morning. We remember again and again we are reformed. We are reformed again and again. We'll talk more about that, think more about that in a moment. But first, I wanted to uh, note and get out of the way that we've had some technical difficulties this morning. It's a little bit of why we're beginning our worship service a few minutes late. So uh, David Durfee was to be our liturgist for this morning. Um, and I met with David on Zoom on Wednesday, and we recorded a beautiful beautiful set of prayers and a scripture reading, and uh, Nan, uh, sorry, Elisa was working on the slideshow, and then I was working on the slideshow, and I put those videos in the slideshow, and then I uploaded them to the cloud, and when we got to church this morning, they're not on the cloud. Um, and it wasn't discovered until it was past the time that I could go home and get my computer and bring it in and get the slideshow that has all of the, the readings from David. So unfortunately, I am very sorry to, I, to David and to all of us that we're not going to hear David as a liturgist this morning, but we will get him uh, to do, a, do another uh, Sunday for us soon. So apologies for that, apologies for the couple minutes delay, but um, we will begin our worship service. So let us take a moment to take a breath in and out and use this time to reflect and prepare our hearts and minds to worship God together.
Please join me, with, join me with this call to worship. Every week is a new week, another chance to say, here I am, use me. Every day is a new day, another chance to say, thank you for yesterday, thank you for tomorrow. Every hour is a new hour, another chance to say, again and again, make me new. We do not come to this place to stay the same. We come to this place to be changed. So let us worship holy God, who created yesterday, will create tomorrow, and even now is creating something new. Thanks be to God. Amen. We come to this touching ground moment, uh, this moment where we come together as we are about to explore together. We like to come together, touch ground. This is where we're starting from. Find a moment um, as we've been engaging in our watchword, our star word for this year, presence. We've been trying to find little um, practices of finding presence. We also, in this time, talk about where we're going for the day. and so. Um, again, we are, we are dwelling in this story that again and again we are reformed. Again and again we are, we are remade and remolded like clay. And we shaped and reshaped, taking on new forms. So that's, what, that's the, the Lenten theme that we're dwelling in today. Again and again we are reformed. For our practice today, I'd like to invite Natalie to come forward and share a little bit about some of her one of her simple spiritual practices she's going to invite us to engage in. Uh, yes, and uh, it is linked to some of the art um, that is part of this week's series, the art piece that's on your bulletin and the art piece that is on uh, the altar. Um, we all think, we often think of coloring as something that we do only as children. And there is research and studies that say coloring for all of us at any age can actually be a very mindful practice and helps bring the brain into being more present. So there's a, a movement that's been on the, I'm gonna put these down. 
um, on the front around uh, encouraging adults to, to color, to use coloring as um, something that brings them the presence. They have tools, like you might use markers. These are double-sided markers with a, a fine end. They have colored pencils that these are colors of empowerment uh, for all womankind. Right? So to help encourage this. They have coloring books, <laughs> often that have intricate designs that you can color at will. Um, they have coloring books about certain themes. Body positivity is one that I have. And then they have, for those of, of you and us who might think, oh, goodness, how do I even begin to color? This is color by number, stained glass pieces <laughs> that actually give you little numbers and a, and a code at the back as to which colors go with which numbers. So I, I had those books as a kid. Those were my favorite colors. Yeah, right? Still here. Have them as adults. And then um, they also have a reverse coloring book, right, where they actually provide coloring pages already colored, and you draw the designs with a pen or a marker. There's all kinds of ways for all kinds of people <coughs> to engage in this practice. And again, what it does is it allows you to bring your brain and mind to the present, not unlike contemplative prayer, not unlike meditation. It gives your brain um, an activity to do, it brings you into the present. So what I'd like to invite you to do is in today's service or any service, we have put colored pencils in front of you in the pews. These are for the choir. <laughs> And there are pencils I th behind you on the table. There are some pencils for deacons back in the um, little cup on their table. If you don't find a color that you like, um, look around, ask a neighbor. They are spread throughout all of the areas. And, and take a you know, moment during worship today um, when you find yourself, maybe your mind drifting or thinking about something maybe pick up that pencil and color. We have larger, if anyone's interested in a eight and a half by 11 coloring page. Our deacons in the back have those available. It is a little small. But a challenge. But that one's larger. But that one's larger. So if you'd like one of those, those are available. Um, the, the piece today says, I will be their God and they shall be my people, which is. So thank you. So I'm very obviously not David Durfee, but I'll do the best I can to substitute for him. In the Gospel of John, a group of Greek people approach the disciples and say, we would like to see Jesus. It's a brief, beautiful moment that the text doesn't spend a lot of time on, and yet it always catches my eye. It catches my eye because the phrase, I want to see Jesus, feels like it should be my constant prayer. Help me see Jesus. I'd like to see Jesus. Bring me closer to Jesus. In the prayer of confession, we take a moment to recognize how much space exists between us and those words trusting that even when we forget to seek out God, God is seeking us out. So join me in the prayer of confession today as we take one step closer to the divine. Gracious God, we want to see you. We want to be known as the people who looked for Jesus. But not only that, we want to be people who have your covenant written on our hearts. Why do you feel so far away from that at times? What went wrong? Where did we lose our way? Could you, would you once again? We would be so grateful. Amen. Friends, 
despite our wanderings, despite our distractions, despite wrong turns time and time again, we are known and loved by God. Like a lighthouse keeper by the sea, God will never stop waving us home. So hear and believe the good news of the gospel. Our fragile bones are held by the great creator. Our fragile hearts are loved by the great creator. Our tender spirits are forgiven by the great creator. Today is a new day. Again and again, we are forgiven. Again and again, we are reformed. Thanks be to God. Amen. We come to our moment for our blessed community, a time when we celebrate what is going on in the life of our church community and our wider community of Bennington. We begin with birthdays and anniversaries, but having checked the uh, church directory app on my iPhone, which if you don't have the church directory app on your iPhone, I suggest, or your smartphone, smart device, I suggest that you contact the church office and Robin would be happy to help you. It's a handy, handy reference. Anyway. There are no birthdays or anniversaries according to our, uh, to our church directory. So uh, is anyone celebrating anything this week? Anything you'd like to celebrate? Oh, Happy today is Bear Today is Bear Bruston's birthday. Bear Bruston's birthday. Last day of the Three days of Washington was Washington. Right. Uh, the organizer of the, the original March on Washington in 1963 with Martin Luther King. Today was his birthday. Bear Bruston. Um, St. Patrick's Day. Happy St. Patrick's Day as well. We celebrating St. Pa a number of you are celebrating St. Patrick's Day. I see that. I, I came in and, and this morning and I saw Lillian's. Good morning, Lillian. Glad you're here. And she's perfect for St. Patrick's Day, and I'm like, I'm wearing gray. Um, I'm perfect for Lent, I suppose. Um, but anyone else celebrating anything other than St. Patrick's Day? Celebrating, <laughs> celebrating very well, with lighted, lighted hats and everything. Celebrating springtime. Celebrating springtime. So, um, a couple of our members would like to tell us about uh, some films that are showing uh, locally. Um, so the first, I'm going to have David uh, speak first, and then I'm going to invite um, Grace. So uh, I'm promoting a biopic on the life of St. Francis Cabrini. It's currently playing right now at our movie theater. I saw it last night. I recommend it. Um, this is, I'm promoting this because, another reason, because this is Women's History Month, and she is the first woman to be sent by the Vatican as a missionary. Um, she was beginning, she began an orphanage and petitioned the Vatican and finally went there to get this mission. She butted heads against uh, the Archbishop of New York, the mayor of New York City, and the Senate of Italy to try to get funding and to have all this happen. She, I knew from studying her life that um, she set up many, many orphanages and hospitals across the United States. What I didn't know until a few days ago was that she also set them up in South America, and the film says also in Europe, and eventually to China, which is where she originally wanted to go. 
So this is a woman who was like, I think about five feet tall. She almost drowned as a child and throughout her life was plagued by lung problems, um, was told constantly, stay where you belong. And she never took no for an answer and went on to become the first saint that was uh, the first American declared saint by the Vatican and um, a woman that we can all emulate. Thank you, David. It will leave Wednesday. It will leave Wednesday, uh, he thinks. It may. it may leave Wednesday. Um, Grace, would you like to come forward? Um, that was a great movie, and I think one of the powerful things about that was that she constantly believed that she was about to die. I think they gave her, what, two years to live, and then another, and then it kept being, and then she lived till she was 65. 67. Thank you. Um, I am promoting a film called Seeing Through the Wall, Meeting Ourselves in Palestine and Israel. It is, although the ongoing genocide in Gaza is happening, this is a recent trip that was prior to October 7th. Um, of a of filmmakers um, to Palestine and Israel to, um, oh, where was it? I'll just read the press release. The film Seeing Through the Wall, Meeting Ourselves in Palestine and Israel will be screened at the Bennington Museum on Sunday, March 24th at 3 p.m. The film documents the recent trip, prior to October 7th, of a small group of Jews to that area um, the Vermonters Reb, Rabbi Dov Taylor and filmmaker Ian Maxud will be present for the background and discussion. And admission is free and open to the public. I hope that you can make it. Um, Robert Novak, Novak has gone to a great deal of trouble to put this together. He has been in our community for quite a long time. And um, it would be eye-opening and hopefully helpful to understanding what has happened, this is the poster, what has happened in uh, Palestine prior to the current conflict. Thank you. Thank you, thank you Grace, and thank you for your leadership on, on this issue. Um, again, that is next Sunday at 3 o'clock, and I uh, will echo Grace's hope that you can make it. It is on my calendar. So that is Seeing Through the Wall next Sunday at 3 p.m. And there are a number of posters around the church that you can find. Um, and then Cabrini is playing at the Bennington Cinemas at least through um, next, this coming Wednesday. Uh, so any other announcements? Um, we have Holy Week coming up. It start, starts uh, next Sunday. So next Sunday, 10 a.m. is our Palm Passion Sunday service. It kicks off our Holy Week, and then uh, we will have Thursday, Monday, Thursday at 7 o'clock. Uh, Good Friday is a noon service here, um, and the, the Holy Saturday Vigil is going to be at 7 p.m. as well. And then Easter Sunday, we have two services, an 8 a.m. contemplative service with communion and a 10 a.m. traditional service with the full choir. And so I hope that you will engage with us as much as possible during Holy Week. Uh, is there a hand? Am I? Yes. Thank you, thank you, Natalie. We'll get, uh, for the for the benefit of those at home, and welcome those who join us virtually. I have neglected to welcome you specifically this morning. Glad that you are with us. Um, Ari, would you give them a, a peek at what, what what we're talking about there on the wall? So um, we have visuals from our Lenten series, and they are on the altar and then they are moving over to the wall. And underneath the, um, on the wall is an is a, uh, artistic, the, uh, the statement of the artist, helping us to understand and unpack the image a little bit more. And so we encourage you to, after those services, uh, do that. 
There's also, if we look in the back here, um, on the door, you might see a, a very colorful ampersand. Uh, that's our stained glass ampersand that we made together. There's another one on the table next to it that is still in progress, so I, I encourage you to work on that as well during the service, after the service, and during the week. So um, all of that going on, anything else to celebrate or announce for our blessed community? And let us continue with our worship. Let us continue in the spirit of prayer. Holy God, scripture tells us that your word is written on our hearts, but we struggle to hear it. Is it possible that we have covered up your words with our own self-narratives? Is it possible that we have erased your truth to write our own? 
Is it possible that we have forgotten your words entirely? Take us back to the beginning. Remove the self-talk that distracts. Clear away the cobwebs of doubt. Show us how to look inside ourselves for your truth. And then write it on our hearts once more. We are listening. We are hopeful. We are here. Speak now. Amen. Our first scripture reading this morning is from the Gospel of John, chapter 12, verses 20 through 33, as told in the Message Bible. And as I was reading this, one of my favorite quotes came to mind. It's a Mexican proverb that says, they tried to bury us, but they did not know we were seeds. Here's John's version of that quote. There were some Greeks in town who had come up to worship at the feast. They approached Philip, who was from Bethsaida in Galilee. Sir, we want to see Jesus. Can you help us? Philip went and told Andrew. Andrew and Philip together told Jesus. Jesus answered, time's up. The time has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Listen carefully. Unless a grain of wheat is buried in the ground dead to the world, it is never any more than a grain of wheat. But if it is buried, it sprouts and reproduces itself many times over. In the same way, anyone who holds on to life just as it is destroys that life. But if you let it go, reckless in your love, you'll have it forever, real and eternal. If any of you wants to serve me, then follow me. Then you'll be where I am, ready to serve at a moment's notice. God will honor and reward anyone who serves me. Right now, I am shaken. And what am I going to say? God, get me out of this? No, this is why I came here in the first place. I'll say, God, put your glory on display. A voice came out of the sky. I have glorified it, and I'll glorify it again. The listening crowd said, thunder. Others said, an angel spoke to him. Jesus said, the voice didn't come for me, but for you. At this moment, the world is in crisis. Now Satan, the ruler of the world, will be thrown out. And I, as I am lifted up from the earth, will attract everyone to me and gather them around me. He put it in this way to show how he was going to be put to death. May God add a blessing to this reading. From the book of the prophet Jeremiah, and the translation, The Voice. Look. The days are surely coming when I will bring about a new covenant with the people of Israel and Judah. It will not be like the covenant I made with their ancestors long ago, 
when I took them by the hand and led them out of bondage in Egypt. They did not remain faithful to that covenant, even though I loved and cared for them as a husband. This is the kind of new covenant I will make with the, new, with the people of Israel when, the day, when those days are over. I will put my law within them. I will write it on their hearts. I will be their God, and they will be my people. No longer will people have to teach each other or encourage their family members and say, you must know the eternal, for all of them will know me intimately themselves, from the least to the greatest of society. I will be merciful when they fail and forgive their wrongs. I will never call to mind or mention their sins. May God add a blessing to these readings. I would like to thank Ari and uh, Elisa and Natalie for scrambling to um, get us on board this morning with our slideshows. That is the picture from last week because I updated it last night and then that one's the one that's missing, but that's okay. Um, so thank you. Thank you, for Elisa, for jumping in, um, filling in as liturgist, and thank you to David. I'm, I am sorry that you didn't get to hear David's readings. They were beautiful. Thank you to the choir for that beautiful um, a beautiful anthem, the Christological Confession, it's called. You are the Christ. It's identifying Jesus when we see Jesus. Thank you. Thank you to the deacons and to all the hearts and hands that make our worship possible. Would you pray with me, please? Spirit of the living God, fall afresh on us. And may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, for you, O oh God, are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. I'll tell you the truth that um, as I listen to Lisa read that scripture from John, and then as I read the passage from Jeremiah myself, I am not at all convinced that I have uh, a sermon to tell you that is going to stand up to these great passages. These are really rich texts this morning. And there's, there's not a way that I'm going to possibly handle all of what's packed in here. So I guess I'm telling you that so much as a practice of me trying to let go of that for a moment so that I can tell you what I've planned to tell you and maybe what the Spirit wants me to tell you in this moment. I brought with me this morning this Bible. This was my seminary Bible. This is the, this is the Bible I took to class with me every class for three years. And I don't use it very much now because um, most of my engagement is with, um, with the screen, right? The, the Bible is available on the computer and all the different translations, not just the one. And so I'm, I'm used to seeing the Bible, reading it on the, on the screen. But I wanted to bring it in because I got thinking about, as, as I looked at this Bible and then all the different Bibles on my shelf, my relationship with the Bible and how it's changed over time. 
particularly because of how I handled the story last week. If you recall, we, 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 had, we heard a story last week from the book of Numbers that talked about how when the children of Israel were wandering through the wilderness, they were grumbling. They were upset. They were upset at God. They were upset at Moses. Why did you drag us here? There's no food. The food is, is bad, and the food that God gave us is, like, worse, and so there's no water. We should just be back in bondage and slavery. You should just never have brought us out here. And in this text, the way, the, the, the way it's written in the text, there is one verse It says, God responds to their crumbling and their complaining by sending poisonous snakes. And then telling Moses how to help the people that get bit by the snakes. It's a it is a nice story. Um, if you take the bit about God taking the, sending the snakes out, which is what I did, right? I did. I, it's what we talked about, and I still feel like I need to justify that somehow. I don't know. Maybe it's because of my long relationship with this. With this, maybe it's the humility that I should have that that no one of us should be deciding what's in or out on our own, that we do that in community. And if, if that story rings more true to you and your experience of God, that God sent the snakes, then who am I to tell you otherwise, especially if the text says something different? But my relationship with that Bible, with this book, this holy book, holiness as I've been defining it the last few months, taking the definition from Mordecai Kaplan, that holiness is that which is the quality that a person or a thing, like a book, has when it works to bring the human being fully alive. And so I think my entire life I've been engaging with this book, with this wrestling with this book, this Bible, trying to find what's holy in it. And so for me last week, sometimes what's, what's holy means letting go of the husk, letting go of the pieces that aren't life-giving to me. And now, because of my position, because you've called me here, I stand before you and I share what I find life-giving in hopes that it's what you find life-giving as well. That my relationship, my struggling with the Bible might help you in your journeying with the Bible. Maybe it's not, maybe you haven't had that kind of oppositional relationship that I have. Maybe you don't find as much of the Bible distancing as I do. But I th feel like the important thing is to stay engaged again and again. We are reformed. Our thinking is reformed over time. Again, And that's true of the church, the church, the church of Christ, the traditions of Christianity. In 1900, the liberal theologian and church historian Adolf von Harnack, there's a name that I haven't said or thought of since I graduated seminary. Von Harnack, or Harnack wrote um, or gave a series of lectures at the turn of the century, 1900, entitled, What is Christianity? Harnack was interested in getting at what is, what is Christianity now? He's asking the same question I am, really. What is life-giving? How is this life-giving? His first 
sermon, his first lecture was entitled, The Colonel and the Hut. This is, it's an important and a famous lecture. And uh, Harnack's image there is of a, of a wheat kernel, or kernel of corn, right? And that said, what, our, what his task is, is to discover what that kernel is of Christianity. What is the life-giving essence? What is the seed? And what is the shell? And what is the shell? What can be... What can be fall away? What is, from the historian's point of view, he's thinking like a historian, what is incidental to the context, to the historian context of the Bible and what's written in it, of our theology and what's developed over time? Another way we might, we might think of it is, where are we hearing the still speaking voice of God? singing through, shimmering through, shining through a text 2,000 years later. Where do we hear that? What's the kernel of truth? What is the husk that can, be, that can fall away? Because Jesus says in that passage from John this morning, unless, the, unless that husk falls away, then that seed, that kernel can't grow. And sometimes we may find over the course of our lives that what we thought was the kernel, or what was the kernel, what was life-giving at that time, is no longer life-giving. And we, let, we have to let that go to discover again what is the kernel, what is now life-giving. Progress, and I got to gut check myself because when I heard someone say this a few weeks ago, I did a double take. Progress is a narrative. What do I mean by that? Progress, what I mean is a narrative is a story we tell ourselves to make sense of things, and to make sense of things in relation to our values and how we see the world. But progress is a narrative. We believe that the arc of the hit moral universe is long, but it bends toward justice. We believe in that progress. But that narrative that we're always moving, that progress, we're always moving forward, can, I think, give us an uncharitable view of the past. And our past, when we want to be charitable, when we need to be charitable to ourselves. That as we look back, as I look back, as I look back with my wrestling and where I've been, with my relationship with the Bible, my relationship God, with God, I could look back and say, mm, I, didn't li I don't like how you, what you're thinking. Now, as I look back, but that Mark was doing the best that he could to survive, to live, and to try and find a connection with God. And he didn't know. And now he's, he knows a little better, hopefully, and some of that husk has to fall away. And there's more again and again reformed, reshaped, reformed inside. But that's the story I tell myself. And it's healing doesn't happen in a straight line. And you know, I really, here's the reason I'm actually saying all of this. Sometimes we use the word evolution in a way that it makes it seem, in a way with a connotation as we're evolving into something better. 
that evolution is making better. But that's not what evolution is. That's not what evolution is at all, if we actually listen to the biology. Evolution is adapting, is adaptation. Evolution is not the same as getting better. It is adapting to survive and thrive to the current context. So whoever wrote thousands of years ago this story, and there wasn't a singular writer of most of this, that group of folks, that tribe of people that have this story of being in the desert and wandering and God, they're just trying to, they just want some release. And then there were snakes. And the best that they understood it, their God sent the snakes to test them. And maybe you've had an experience in your life where a story like that could be life-giving to you. And maybe for you, that is a kernel of truth. That there are times where we need to, we need to be tested. For me, that's not been my experience. So I, again and again, I was born. Not to get better, but to, 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 to thrive, to adapt to where I understand, I understand where I am now. I wonder how SCC again and again has reformed over 200 years, has adapted over 200 years. In other words, how has Second Congregational Church again and again adapted to be holy, to be life-giving? Uh, the one thing that comes off just in my mind right now is becoming the first open and affirming congregation in the state of Vermont, adapting to the context understanding oh, and reforming so that we can be more welcoming to all of God's people, more life-giving. Again and again, we are reformed. Roger uh, Nishi Nishioka, Roger Nishioka is a, a preacher. He was formerly a professor, an associate professor at Columbia Theological uh, Seminary He's currently uh, now the senior pastor of a church in Iowa, or Kansas, sorry. Uh, but uh, in 2013, he was still a professor at Columbia Seminary, and uh, he gave a talk at Montreat Conference Center um, to the Presbyterians. And this, the title of his talk was 21st century reformation. And he, the, his thesis, um, or an assumption that I think we many of us have heard, is that the Christian church is undergoing another reformation, another reforming, another big one. In our reformed tradition, the the line of Christianity that we trace ourselves back to in the United Church of Christ and the Congregationalists and the Puritans, and back to the Mother Church. In that tradition, we say we are Reformed and always reforming. So the Reformation doesn't end, but there are times when maybe it takes on bigger shape. And I know I've mentioned this book before. I know many of you have heard of it before. The Great, well not, the Great Emergence, Phyllis Tickle. And what she noted is that every, about every 500 years, there's a big shakeup. The church goes through some kind of reforming period. And when you're in the midst of it, you don't know what it's going to look like. We don't know. That's part of of where we are at right now. God's church, Christ's church, is reforming itself, to adapting. And uh, Nishioka 
identifies several trends. And I only, I'm only going to highlight a, a couple of them, but I, I do intend to share this video with church leaders and, um, and our Imagine Church team because I think these trends are helpful. And I think while he was speaking in 2013, I think um, most of them, have, he, he, I think the 10 years since he spoke these words, um, it's even more... I think, I think he's even more clearly correct. Uh, so, if, and, and I will note that I think we're already on the trajectory of engaging with these trends. We're all, we've already been reforming and again and again moving in these directions before I got to the point. The first is, he says, um, a shift from, to immigrant education. And what he mean, means by that is that what we, want to, what we need to realize as a church is that when we draw new friends in, more and more of them aren't going to have the same experience of Christianity that we do. So he, he tells a story about how um, a, a, there's a church uh, attracting a lot of college students. And, and he, he engaged with one that had said, He'd gone to two different churches. One was Methodist, and one was, I think he said Baptist, but it might have been Presbyterian. I don't remember. Two different denominations. And in both of them, um, where we sing the doxology, they sing, they sing something called the Gloria Patri. Gloria Patri. Glory be to the Father. And, yeah, and to the Son and to the Holy Ghost. Well, this student has drawn, said, Roger, both of the bulletins named this person who never stood up, who never said anything, and it was never talked about. Who is, who is Gloria Patri? And he said, oh, well, so did, did they sing while they, when, when they said, yes, yeah, both times, everybody got up and sang, and he said, yeah, so that's, Gloria Patri is Latin for the first line that they sing, glory be to the Father, Gloria Patri. So if we're going to share the good news that we have, we need to translate it into, we need to educate and, and think about that not everybody has the same experience and background that we do. His uh, next one is on mission. What effect are you having on your community? And one young person said, wouldn't it be nice if they made a difference? Now, she was saying that in reference to a church that she witnessed in her community where everybody drives in on Sunday morning, they do their thing, and then they drive away into the community. Now, that is not, again, that's not us, right? We are, we are engaged in making a difference in our community. We're making that difference again and again. And we continue to work that we can make a greater difference in our community. The last, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll mention two more. He has eight, but I'll mention two more. Uh, the first that I'll mention is uh, from Reasoned Spirituality to mystery-filled spirituality. So what, he, and you know, when we're talking about trends that he's identifying, he's identifying trends in what people, what younger people, people in general, are finding life-giving. What are they seeking when they're seeking church? Mystery, awe, and wonder. This is why, this is why when, ever since I came, it's, I keep saying it's not about the answers. Hold, hold what we believe with open hands. Because when we, what we cling to, when we cling to our, our, our belief and our reason and that we know best, it's taking us away from where God is leading us. 
away from mystery and awe. This is why I've been so um, so pleased with Natalie and Elisa's work, sharing their gifts of this, these arts, to have us engage not with our reason, but with our sense of wonder. Sand. But it's beautiful. Again and again, we are reformed, taking on different shapes and trusting that we are in the hands of a loving God. And this is why I'm grateful to Elisa and Natalie, because um, in my house, I am known as an accomplished putz. <laughs> I was reforming it, yes. The, we were shaking off the husk <laughs> to get to the kernel of the ampersand. And the last, the last of Nishioko's um, trends that he identified that I'd like to point to is from discipleship to apostleship. And this is, this is one that's a little less comfortable for uh, those of us who are introverts, who are particularly introverted about our faith, who being small e evangelical, spreading the good news, mm. it's a little scary. But you know, we have a, we have some goals that our Imagine Church team developed for us. And I'm so pleased that the last one of those goals is that we will be bold about sharing our good news. We will be bold about sharing our good news. That, my friends, isn't discipleship. That's not, we're going we're gonna to follow Jesus together as an inner circle, be very, very clear about what the boundaries are, who's in and who's out, and Move. The apostles are about going out, meeting people where they are, and helping them find God, find what's life-giving, and sharing what is life-giving for us to help them. The good news, being bold about our good news, that we are a congregation that is reformed and reforming, always to adapt so that what we provide to ourselves, to one another, to our community, is life-giving. Because remember that, remember this story, this, I, this image that Jesus says consistently we hear it in these, in these John passages we sing that he must be lifted up, like that snake, like that serpent in that story we heard last week. And that when he's lifted up, the husk falls off. And again and again, we are reformed, finding what is life-giving and sharing it. Amen.
again and again we gather and share our joys and our concerns and lift them together to God. It is our privilege to do so as Christians in community with one another. So I invite you to pray with me. This is a prayer that comes from Terry and was written on, posted on Rev Gal Pal blog. Gracious God, we come to you broken. From that which confines us. We come to you broken from that which confines us, the prejudice buried, the weighted down with fear, distorted self-protection, breaking me, breaking you. And so we come to you, O oh God, seeking to be made whole. For you, God, put your love within us. You wrote it on our hearts that we may be your people again and again. On this day, we pray with those who weep, who are struggling from lack of clean water, healthy food, quality, affordable health care, women who want to make decisions about their families, their lives, their bodies, how and when and with whom. And so we come seeking you to be made whole. For you, God, put your love within us. You wrote it on our hearts that we may be your people again and again. Compassionate God, God of covenant, God of love, we come to you tired, yearning for peace and harmony. Loving God, we offer up our suffering and come to you seeking to be made whole. For you, O oh God, put your love within us, you wrote it on our hearts that we may be your people again and again. And so, O oh God, again and again, you hear the prayers of this, your people, of Second Congregational Church. And so we are grateful that you are listening now. As we pray for those and with those, all of them on our prayer list, Ty and Janice and Quincy, Barb, Barbara, David and Trudy, Dean, Meredith, Iris, Fran, we lift up prayers for migrants and refugees and their families everywhere as we stand in solidarity with them. We think especially, O oh God, of lifting prayers for Gaza, for Muslim members of this community of Bennington, and all those who are see seeing an uptick in harassment due to the genocide in Gaza. And we do mean all, O oh God. We remember the suffering of our Jewish friends and neighbors. Prayers have lifted uh, from this beloved one of gratitude, O oh God, for their dentist. We give thanks, O oh God, for health care, for access to health care. We lift up prayers of joy for the continuing recovery of Meredith, who has been home now for several weeks. Thank you all, thinking of the congregation for all of your prayers. Prayers for the family of Devin Francis, who passed away in a car accident yesterday. Devin was 25 years old. He leaves behind a wife and young son. 
prayers for his friends as well. He was a lovely man and a wonderful friend. Also prayers for Rick Davis and his family as he faces a long recovery process from the same accident. Oh God, this was a catastrophic accident. It has touched so many in our community. In fact, it does. In your mercy, hold all of these prayers. In your mercy and in your love, you hear all of our prayers, O God, whether we hold them silently or in our hearts or if we have lifted them with our voices. And so, gentle God, God of covenant, of love, glorify us through your love. Draw us to you, into you. Anoint us with your peace. Write your compassion in our hearts that we may love as you love again and again. As we say the words that Christ taught us to pray, saying, Our God, who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Thank you for your faithfulness, your faithful service and uh, giving to Second Congregational Church again and again, your time, your talents, and yes, your financial gifts as well. And so I invite you to, during this time, reflect on the ways in which you are being called to give.
Oh God, again and again, you reform our meager and grand gifts and shape them to be life-giving for us and for our community. And so, oh God, we ask that you would bless these, our gifts, our gifts of time and talent and finances, that you would again and again reform them to be blessings for us and for our community. Amen. And so, friends, as we have been transformed by this encounter with God's grace, let us remind ourselves how we are to be. Go forth into the world in peace. Be of good courage. Hold fast to that which is good. Render to no one evil for evil. Strengthen the faint-hearted. Support the weak. Help the afflicted. Honor all people, love and serve the Lord, caring for God's earth, and rejoicing in the power of the Holy Spirit again and again and again. And so, friends, receive this blessing. As you leave this space, may your mouth speak of God's goodness. May your arm Hold those in need. May your feet walk towards justice. May your heart trust its worth. May your soul dance in God's grace. And may this be your rhythm again and again and again. Until God's promised day, in the name of the lover, the beloved, and love itself, go with courage, go with heart, go with peace. Thanks be to God.